2015, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, met in Paris and announced that in order to stabilise greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic or human-induced interference with the climate system, global temperatures should be no more than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels with an aspirational target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. In 2018, however, in light of the continuing build-up of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the IPCC revised its 2 degree maximum global temperature increase target, proclaiming that it must now be kept below 1.5 degrees Celsius if we are to avoid catastrophic climate change. The IPCC assumes that 1.5 degrees Celsius would be reached with business as usual by 2050 based on its projection of 0.2 degrees Celsius warming every decade. This might be rather conservative, however, since the global temperature has risen by over 0.3 degrees Celsius in the last 10 years. To achieve this goal of less than 1.5 degrees Celsius, the IPCC says that carbon dioxide emissions would need to fall 45% below 2010 levels in the next 12 years, that's 2030, and by 2050, net carbon dioxide emissions must be zero. This is made all the more difficult by the fact that the International Energy Agency reported that 2017 saw an increase of carbon emissions to a record high of 32.5 gigatons. This rise was mainly due to increased demand in Asia, most particularly China. In all fairness to China, it is the industrial kitchen of the world, producing carbon emissions largely because it makes the products that are shipped to consumers all over the globe. Were individual countries to produce products they import from China, their individual carbon emissions would increase significantly. Keeping global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius is a mammoth task. Some might say impossible, technologically, politically and economically, given our current dependence on fossil fuels and the timescale required. It is fair to say that if it could be done, it would be among the greatest, if not the greatest, achievement in human history. It would involve drastically reducing our current production of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases such as methane and nitrous oxide, as well as protecting and increasing the natural means by which carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere, commonly referred to as carbon sinks. While it is important to tackle all aspects of climate change, this presentation will concentrate primarily on the best way of replacing the major energy greenhouse gas sources, coal, petroleum and natural gas. Globally, electricity generation and transport are major fuel consumption sectors for greenhouse gas emissions by a considerable amount, and finding adequate replacements for energy to power these sectors is absolutely essential if the world is to reduce carbon emissions significantly. The world uses over a staggering 130,000 terawatt hours of energy a year, about 80% of which is used for transportation and heating. Approximately 20% is used for the production of electricity. However, if we are to replace our reliance on petroleum, coal and gas for transportation and heating, the current view is that it must be done almost exclusively with electrification, using renewable energy in the form of wind and solar with battery storage, hydropower and nuclear. Nuclear, however, although still developing in China and India, has been on the decline in OECD countries, where in places like Germany and California, nuclear plants are now being decommissioned. As for hydroelectric power, while it does not produce carbon dioxide, its use is limited by location factors. Currently, hydro produces about 70% of the world's power, with China being the main producer. China, however, has dammed nearly all of its major rivers, and there's little room for any further expansion without damming the rivers in the remote southwest. Conservatively, at this rate of growth, the world could be consuming more than 40,000 terawatt hours of electricity by 2050. Obviously though, if wind and solar sources were to largely replace the energy produced by coal, oil and gas for all electricity generation, as well as transportation and heating, their share of energy production would have to increase significantly, by at least triple from what fossil fuels are now producing. Currently less than a third of the world's electricity is produced from non-fossil fuel sources, primarily hydro and nuclear, with a small amount of wind, solar and geothermal. Most electricity is produced from fossil fuel sources, coal, natural gas and petroleum. By 2050, 
100% of electricity must be produced by non-fossil fuel sources, with wind and solar the most favoured by the majority of OECD countries, meaning that by 2050 no electricity can be produced by coal, natural gas or petroleum. Liquid hydrogen might also play a part in the transition from petroleum in the transport sector. Hydrogen is used to launch rockets into space and as fuel for transit buses. However, once again, electricity is required to split water and separate hydrogen from oxygen by electrolysis, the only alternative for large-scale fossil-free production. Whichever way we look at it, electricity generation is at the heart of the problem. Can we produce enough electrical power using primarily wind and solar or must they play a subsidiary and minor role to the only non-greenhouse gas-emitting energy source capable of producing substantial amounts of energy? Nuclear. The first thing we must understand about wind and solar energy is that they are dilute or weak and intermittent or unreliable. They both require huge surface areas to produce adequate power. And they are not operational when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining. This presents a huge problem as dilute or intermittent power sources are not well suited to powering the grid, most particularly with respect to baseload electricity, especially with the added burden of providing extra electricity to replace petroleum for electric cars and other electric transport vehicles. With an electrical grid, it is important there is a constant supply of electricity even when the demand is low. In a typical day, this period is usually at night when people are sleeping and business activity is at a minimum. This is the period when a basic amount of electricity is required, hence the term baseload. Baseload electricity must be constant and never intermittent, and generally 30-40% to 40 of the maximum load, something for which both wind and solar, because of their unreliability, are unsuitable. During the day, as electricity use increases, a grid will need a flexible or intermediate supply to supplement the baseload. There will also be times during the day, however, when the electricity supply will need to increase even further. This increase beyond the flexible range is a time when there is peak power, so called because it is a time when electrical usage peaks. Currently baseload electricity is generated by coal, natural gas, nuclear and petroleum, and to a lesser extent by hydro and geothermal, although Norway, largely because of its natural topography, generates not only its baseload power but 98% of all its electricity from hydro. Nuclear, hydro and geothermal are the only baseload power sources that are not fossil fuels and do not produce carbon dioxide. Wind and solar fit into the flexible or intermediate range of electricity generation with some capacity for peak power when climate conditions are favourable for wind and solar. Because of their intermittency, they are not at this stage of their development suitable for baseload capacity. Currently, wind and solar make up less than 10% of the world's energy production. Even when we add hydro, 75-80% to 80 of global energy production comes from fossil fuels and nuclear. Intermittency presents a particular problem related to solar energy, and that is that most solar energy is produced in the middle of the day, when energy is least used. Demand for electricity in temperate climates usually increases in the early morning when people wake and prepare for work and peaks in the evening when people are home from work. With increasing solar panel deployment, there is a greater supply of electricity in the middle of the day when the sun is at its highest, but this is the time of less demand. Coal and nuclear plants are required to operate continuously for economic reasons and to provide baseload electricity. They cannot be readily turned off and on. So to avoid overloading and damaging the power grid, operators are often forced to turn the solar supply off, effectively wasting solar energy. To tackle this problem of the intermittency, it is generally accepted that there needs to be a form of renewable energy storage. Currently there are only two options on the table to store wind and solar energy, concentrated solar power or CSP and battery storage. Not to be confused with photovoltaic or PV solar panels, Concentrated solar power takes advantage of highly concentrated direct solar radiation converted to heat which can then be stored most commonly as pressurised steam or in molten salts so that power can be used when required day or night. Since the technology is dependent on direct solar radiation, the system does not work well when there is cloud cover. 
Consequently, concentrated solar power generation plants are best located in areas of intense sunshine, such as deserts, and are therefore very much location dependent. However, having said concentrated solar power plants can store energy, not all plants do. In fact, there are very few that do, and they have relatively small energy storage capacity of 10 to 12 hours, certainly not enough to provide stable baseload power. The primary storage technology to store wind and solar generated power and overcome the intermittency problem is generally considered to be mega battery storage. Indeed, battery storage would seem to be essential if wind and solar energy are to play the major role in reducing carbon dioxide emissions to zero by 2050. Unfortunately, battery storage on a large scale enough to power the grid is presently unachievable, with little prospect in the next 30 years of providing the massive amounts of storage capacity to power the world's future energy needs. By 2040, it is anticipated that electric vehicles alone will draw 1,900 terawatt hours from the grid, which is a huge amount given the current world electricity consumption is close to 20,000 terawatt hours. Viewed in perspective, the world's largest mega battery on the Hornsdale Wind Farm in South Australia is only capable of powering 50,000 homes for a maximum of four hours. Aside from the storage problem, major solar and wind power generation would require huge land areas and for offshore wind sea areas. This can be expressed as power per land area. The late British physicist Sir David Mackay in his book Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air examined the energy sources in terms of their watts per square metre. While wind, both onshore and offshore, were deemed to provide 2 to 3 watts per square metre and photovoltaic solar and concentrated solar power between 5 to 20 watts per square metre, depending on location, nuclear power had a significantly larger ratio of 1000 watts per square metre. He also provides estimates of the energy consumption of different countries, taking into account all forms of daily usage such as electricity, transport, heating, cooling etc. Using an energy measurement of kilowatt hours per day per person, he estimates that people in the UK consume the equivalent of 125 kilowatt hours per day per person, while the consumption in the US is closer to 250 kilowatt hours per day per person. Dave Mackay estimated that if 1 billion people of Europe, North Africa and the Middle East were powered by solar energy alone, it would require an area the size of Germany. If Canada, USA and Mexico were powered by solar energy, it would require an area slightly smaller than Texas to cope with the current level of consumption. Were these North American countries powered by a renewable mix, it would require wind farms covering an area at least the size of California and solar power panels covering an area the size of Arizona. Even Australia with its large land mass and small population would require an area half the size of Tasmania if it was currently solely powered with wind and solar. It is hard to imagine how small land area countries with high populations and high energy usage such as Japan and South Korea could ever be able to generate their energy primarily with wind and solar, albeit with about 4% assistance from hydro. It would be totally unrealistic and for all intents and purposes impossible. Both countries would need to be completely covered in wind and solar farms. The wind and solar predicament of Japan and South Korea is made worse by the fact that more than 70% of the terrain of both countries is mountainous and for the most part totally unsuitable for wind and solar farm construction. Despite this obvious problem, President Moon Jae-in pledged that South Korea, which currently derives one third of its energy from nuclear power, would phase it out over the next 45 years. How it could effectively do this without resorting to fossil fuels remains a mystery. When Japan started to close nuclear power plants following the Fukushima disaster, it was not able to make up the difference with wind and solar and did so by burning more fossil fuels, primarily coal. Dave Mackay's conclusion is that to make a difference, renewables would have to be almost country-sized. Another consideration is what is known as the capacity factor, or CP, which tells us how much electricity can be generated per energy source when an energy facility is working at full capacity. The 2017 capacity factors for the various non-fossil fuel energy sources provided by the US Energy Information Authority show that the capacity factor for nuclear far outperforms other non-fossil fuel energy sources, with only the location-dependent geothermal coming close. 
The question also arises as to how many solar panels and wind turbines would need to be manufactured to provide sufficient electricity for a particular country's needs. By way of example, if the current power of the US was provided by solar, it would require the equivalent of about 29 billion one square meter solar panels. If one solar panel was manufactured every second, it would take about 90 years manufacturing time. And this is not taking into account perhaps the triple the number that would be required with complete electrification of all sectors of the economy. Then of course there is the time taken to install them. Powering the US by wind turbines presents a similar problem. It is estimated that to currently power the US with wind turbines alone would require about 580,000 onshore wind turbines. Each wind turbine takes about two months to be constructed. Assuming 100 turbines were constructed at one time over two months, it would be close to 900 years before the 580,000 turbines were built. But wind power generation may also present another problem. In a recent peer-reviewed Harvard University paper, the claim was made that wind turbines in the US alone could warm the planet by 0.24 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, due to the drag produced by wind turbines preventing cool airflow that would normally cool the Earth. And that is just from wind turbines in the US. Given the insurmountable problems facing wind and solar as a primary means of energy to replace fossil fuels, the only non-carbon dioxide energy source options are nuclear, and in places with advantageous natural topographic resources, hydro and geothermal. Since nuclear is the most energy efficient and non-location dependent energy source capable of providing enough energy to power the world and civilization as we know it, it really does come down to two choices, either continue as we are with fossil fuels and a sprinkling of wind and solar and damn the consequences, or develop nuclear energy on a massive scale to replace fossil fuels. And yet, in these times of climate crisis, nuclear energy remains on the outer, with many nuclear power stations throughout the world being decommissioned. Why is this so, and is it justified in view of the threat to the very existence of Earth and all that live on it? Nuclear energy's reputation grew adversely, largely because nuclear was seen as a means of mass destruction. The mushroom clouds of bombs dropped over Japan during World War II and the tests carried out by the world's major powers during the Cold War and the radiation that followed were forever etched in people's minds. Despite the fact that nuclear has been among the cheapest, most energy efficient and safest electricity generation sources post World War II, there has still been the nagging fear that if something went wrong it would be catastrophic and totally out of control with massive nuclear explosions and life-threatening and cancer-causing radiation that would hang around for thousands of years. Hollywood was all too willing to add to the fear with films such as The China Syndrome while the TV show The Simpsons too paints nuclear energy in a bad light, albeit comically. Then there were the events of Chernobyl and Fukushima which only reinforced people's prejudices. Added to this there is the fear that nuclear power, if it was in the wrong hands, could lead to the development of nuclear bombs by unfriendly countries and terrorist groups. When it comes to safety, it would appear that the fears are totally unjustified. The mortality rate attributable to the various energy sources reveals that nuclear is the safest of all energy per thousand terawatt hours of energy generation. These figures also include deaths resulting from Chernobyl and Fukushima. While there are more than 15,000 deaths at Fukushima, they were primarily the result of the actual tsunami and the panic that followed. There's not been one death attributed to the destruction of the nuclear facility, nor were there cases of serious illness as a result of it. Another major concern is nuclear waste and its disposal. Surprising to most, there is in fact very little nuclear waste and it can be easily and safely stored. According to the Nuclear Energy Institute, if all the nuclear waste commercially produced since the late 1950s were stored in one place, it would cover no more than an American football field to a depth of less than 10 yards or 9 metres. This is also solid waste, not subject to the same leakage problems as liquid waste. France reprocesses much of its nuclear waste for generating new energy. France derives currently about 80% of its electricity from nuclear energy and its safety record is exemplary. 96% of used nuclear fuel is recycled at La Hague Recycling Plant, which can provide power for 17 million people a year. Both France and the US have also been recycling Russian nuclear warheads for nuclear power generation. Interestingly, disposing of used solar panels is much more problematic than nuclear waste. 
While Europe has strict regulations for recycling solar panels and their various components, some of which are quite toxic, the US has no such regulations and most discarded solar panels go into landfill. It is predicted that by 2050 there will be 60 million tonnes of solar PV waste and without strict regulation, much of it in landfills. Considering that the life cycle of a solar panel is 20 to 30 years and that the power per square metre and the capacity factor of solar is much less than nuclear, there'd be 63,000 times more solar waste than there would be nuclear for the same amount of power generation based on Environmental Protection Agency data. Wind turbines too are not immune to the problem of waste as they require rare earth materials for their operation. But according to the US Environmental Protection Agency, rare earth processing requires a cocktail of chemical compounds which produce a tremendous amount of solid waste. Most importantly, wind turbine blades, which are made with composite material, are currently regarded as unrecyclable, and many turbines are reaching the end of their life cycle. It is estimated that by 2050 there will be 43 million tonnes of blade waste worldwide. Wind turbines are also incredibly energy intensive to produce. To allow for increasing energy demand and to replace fossil fuel generation sources would require at least 50 million tonnes of coal to build the turbines and their concrete foundations. Consequently, developing ways of recycling all aspects of wind turbines for reconstruction is of major importance if the problems associated with their manufacture and construction are to be addressed. In view of the problems associated with wind and solar energy, could a massive growth in nuclear energy provide a solution to the world's future energy needs? It is important to understand that most nuclear plants in operation were designed over 45 years ago. The first nuclear reactors, and the majority of those still in use today, stem from a water-cooled nuclear reactor that was built to propel the first nuclear submarine, the Nautilus, built in the early 1950s. The technology, if not the practical application of the technology, has developed considerably since that time. Modern nuclear reactors are now being designed to operate at atmospheric pressure without the need for large containment domes and huge smokestacks. Low pressure alleviates the problem of nuclear meltdown and explosion caused when cooling water overheats, which would normally cause a rapid overheating of the reactor fuel rods. Modern fuels for molten salt reactors and reactors fueled by nuclear laden pebbles the size of golf balls are not only highly efficient but are also designed to empty the fuel into holding or dump tanks for cooling when overheated independently of the reactor. Reactors are now being designed using thorium as a fuel rather than uranium. Thorium is not fissile and therefore not subject to explosion and the release of radioactive material as occurred at the Fukushima nuclear plant. Thorium produces 10 times less radioactive waste than uranium and it stays radioactive for 500 years as opposed to uranium's 10,000 years. Thorium is significantly more energy dense than uranium. Thorium reactors would also alleviate another concern about nuclear energy. Thorium reactors do not produce plutonium, which is essential to produce nuclear bombs. Thorium could also be used to produce transport fuels. This would involve using thorium generated electricity to produce hydrogen from water, which when combined with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, could produce liquid fuels such as ammonia and methanol, both of which do not produce carbon dioxide emissions. The world is facing a stark reality, which really is a race against time. The IPCC equation to alleviate catastrophic climate change demands that the increase in global temperature rise be kept below 1.5 degrees Celsius and to do this requires a 45% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions by 2030 with zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2050. To make this task even remotely possible, given our continued and rising output of carbon dioxide, will require massive political will, leadership and cooperation comparable to war mobilisation and the scientific and technical expertise displayed with the Manhattan Project when the world's greatest minds came together during the Second World War to develop the world's first nuclear bomb. Terrible as the outcome of the Manhattan Project was, the example was set. This time the project would need to work not to develop a means of mass destruction but to find a way to save the earth from the damage that has been done and is continuing to be done since the start of the Industrial Revolution. But time is of the essence, and building a solution to replace fossil fuels cannot happen overnight, but still it must be done quickly, and it must be the most practical and realistic solution possible. There really is no time for second chances, so we have to get it right. 
Is putting our faith in wind and solar energy to solve this most fundamental threat to the Earth and all that live on it the best or even an achievable solution given our current time frame? In view of the problems wind and solar face, probably not. As much as it is out of favour with the majority of OECD countries, the very countries that per capita produce the most carbon dioxide, the most practical and remotely achievable solution would seem to be nuclear energy. And an extraordinary amount of it.